Exchange Church, can we all rise as we go into this time of worship? Let's uh, reflect on this passage together. It comes from Romans 8, verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life or give life to your mortal bodies to a spirit who dwells in you.
God, we thank you for this morning, uh, gathering us together uh, to worship together as a church. To experience you in your glory, God, in your majesty, in your splendor. To gather amongst friends and family with one hope. With one purpose. Celebrate and worship you alone today. Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray that God you be honored and glorified. Lord, that you be pleased with our worship today. Lord, that our hearts will sing for joy. Because in you we have grace and peace unending. We have a hope that can't be taken away. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Lord, that you give of yourself to us so freely. So that we can live life with purpose. So that our meeting here today is not aimless, God. There's very good reason. thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you that it covers over all and that it's sufficient for us. That you'll never take it away from us. So today we come and we come to worship you. Be with this time. Be with our hearts. Be in this place today. Spirit, we ask that you move in this service Lead it in the way that you'd like it to go. And we thank you again for this time, and we love you, and we praise you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Man, if we could uh, remain standing for just a moment. Uh, at this time, we are going to confess our faith together according to the Apostles' Creed. Uh, for those of us who are believers, let's really um, make this a declaration of our faith, what we believe and uh, a reminder of who God is and his love given to us through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Let's confess this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven he is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Uh, you guys can have a seat. Um, morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Exchange Church. It's uh, great to worship with you this morning. Um, I have just a couple announcements uh, for us this morning. Um, first off, if you would uh, like to join a life group, uh, life group is just a small group that uh, gathers weekly to share life around the gospel and um, you know, seek to grow in uh, community and in Christ together. Uh, if you're not currently uh, already in a life group and you'd like to join a life group, uh, you can sign up online or you can uh, sign up outside on the board. Uh, there's a little QR code. You can use that to sign up as well. I do highly encourage you. If you're not in a life group, this is a great way to, you know, build community, find accountability, grow in Christ. And so if that is something that you're interested in, I do highly encourage you to sign up for life groups. And our next term is going to be starting um, at the end of August. And so um, just a heads up for that for all of you. 
Um, we do have an anniversary service coming up soon at uh, the last Sunday of August. And so um, August 27th, I do encourage you all to come out for that as well. We're just going to kind of celebrate God's faithfulness and uh, the life of this church and everything that he has done for us and, um, you know, have some food and some fellowship afterwards. And so please uh, come out to that. Um, yeah, uh, really looking forward to celebrating with all you guys that day as well. Um, just one other thing, uh, you know, I know Heather shared last week about kind of, um, you know, her time coming back from Thailand for the past couple of years, and then she's actually going to be going out to, uh, India in November, and so if you guys would like to give to support her, and I mentioned this last week, but just when you give offering, um, if you just put, uh, Heather in the description, then that will go directly to kind of funding her mission, uh, in India this November, and so I just wanted to give you guys a heads up for that. Um, I believe that's it for announcements, so we do have uh, a special guest speaker for us uh, this morning. Uh, Pastor Jimmy is back. He has uh, <laughs> shared with us a couple times, and, um, you know, he is the pastor of family ministry and small groups at uh, Christ Central um, uh, Christ Central of Southern California. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I'm like CCSE. What does that stand for? But um, he is uh, really just, I mean like an awesome brother uh, to me and, uh, you know, a friend and a mentor. And he's really just, um, I really just appreciate him, um, you know, as a as a fellow brother in ministry and also just this guy is like really uh, OG. <laughs> Sorry, I know that sounds like he's not old, though, but he's an OG. <laughs> and um, he is, uh, you know, he's been doing this for a long time. He's very just a faithful and a, a man of integrity. And so. Uh, he's here with his wife, Jennifer, and um, he's going to be sharing the word for us this morning. And so why don't we give him a hand as he kind of comes up and shares. Okay, I think it's on now. Okay. All right, good morning, uh it's always uh, good to visit with Exchange. Um, I believe I, we were able to char- share a retreat several years ago, and uh, Pastor Joe graciously invites me uh, occasionally to come and share with your church. Um, you know, these days, especially during the summer, I don't know if uh, it, what, whatever kind of summer you've been having, but I hope you had a good one. And as the new year starts to ramp up at the end of summer and fall, I hope we can focus and remember how good God is. Uh, there's a challenge sometimes when we come into worship um, because not everyone had a great week. And not everyone even maybe had a great month. And there are challenges as we gather together as a church uh, because so much is going on in our lives and our hearts. Um, uh, several years ago, a lady by the name of Christina Fox, a mother and a Christian counselor, wrote an article for the Gospel Coalition entitled, When Christ Asked Why. Uh, She talks a little bit about her family experience and relates it to the questions that we find in the book of Psalms. Um, She writes, one of the kids, one of my kids is going through a developmental stage in which everything needs to be logical or make sense. Um, The typical parent response is, because I said so, and it doesn't cut it anymore. And when he makes a request and I say no, he wants to know why. I have two teenagers. I remember the, they don't ask as much, but 13 to 15 or 16, everything was, why? Why? And sometimes I'm just like, be quiet. (laughs) Um, She writes, I can't always give you an answer you will like or even understand. I recently told him sometimes my decisions are based on the big picture and may not be something I can explain to you. In those situations, you're just going to have to remind yourself that I'm your mom and I love you and you're going to have to trust me. She writes, I understand my son struggled to accept my decision since I sometimes struggle over circumstances God brings into my life. They don't always make sense, and I too want to know why. Why am I in this pain? Why am I waiting so long? Why has this trial come into my life? Why hasn't God answered my prayer? We aren't alone in asking such questions because the psalmist in many times will ask God, this question why. For example, in Psalm 10, 
Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 42. I will say to my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? Psalm 74. O God, why do you cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? And on and on and on. And I love the fact that the Bible, and especially the book of Psalms, doesn't sugarcoat our relationship with God or the days that challenge us on a regular basis. It doesn't make religion sound as though we have to all smile and accept and be good. Because sometimes Sundays we walk into worship and we're like, good morning, praise God, (laughs) good to see you. Sometimes it's hard. It's hard to smile. It's hard to come in and try to be cheerful and all good. In fact, sometimes people come into a Sunday worship expecting to be lifted up. And it's hard when sometimes those lifting up moments come very infrequently because they don't always meet us where we are. I remember the times when I would ask God these same questions. Even recently, um, a dear uncle of mine uh, recently passed away from uh, a, a long battle with cancer, stomach cancer. And as much as I love my uncle and I know he's with the Lord, I think the person that my heart ached for was his wife. She remarried him after losing her first husband to cancer and also her daughter, who was only just 11 years old, to cancer. And now she lost a second husband to cancer. She's a woman of faith, very prayerful, uh, loves the Lord, and yet her suffering and loss were so great And I remember my wife and I just sitting there thinking, gosh, what kind of pain must she be going through? This morning, she must be sitting in a worship at her church. And sometimes as we sit and we ask the question why, sometimes the silence can be deafening. There are times when we wish God would speak audibly and bring some sense or reason into the times where our soul needs more than just a trust me. A lot of people have felt this way, and today's passage is a beautiful psalm that expresses great pain in the form of a question. In Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2, Psalm 22 begins with, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, and I find no rest. As I read this psalm, perhaps as you read it in the beginning, if you've been in the church for a while, you know that it kind of sounds like something else that you might have heard and read. King David wrote this psalm. And in commentary to Psalm 22, James Montgomery Boyce writes that Psalm 22 is a description of an execution, particularly a crucifixion. Because within this psalm, David writes that they pierced my hands and my feet. They say that they are casting lots for my clothing. And he says, uh, and he speaks about this experience, although David himself, as far as we know in his life story, his hands and feet were never pierced. And so what is understood is that this, this psalm is perhaps a prophetic one speaking about a future event, particularly the crucifixion, which was not practiced during the time of David, but would come centuries later. So this is not an account of suffering endured by any ancient person, but a prophetic picture of the suffering to be endured by Jesus when he would die to pay the penalty for our sins. It is an entirely prophetic and entirely messianic psalm. And if it was written prophetically, then when he was prophesying of this future event, and of course, the, of course the words, I believe, were intentionally identical with the words Jesus would utter as he hung on the cross. In Matthew 27, verses 45 to 50, it says this, And now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cr- cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them uh, at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. It's no mistake that while Jesus is hanging on the cross, he utters these words almost verbatim to the beginning of Psalm 22. And that some might say that this is actually Jesus not crying out, not just crying out in his heart, but also turning the attention of those who are familiar with the book of Psalms and understanding something is being fulfilled right in in the presence of your eyes. You know, when life is difficult and troubles come into our days, we all ask the question, why? And we wonder if God loves us. Because when hardships come, even like a child, when discipline comes, when difficult days come, sometimes kids will wonder, do you love me? I remember times when my kid, I remember my son saying, you don't love me. And I'm thinking, boy, you have no idea how much I love you. The fact that he could utter those words was circumstantial and lacking a bigger picture perspective. I'm sure the disciples asked the same question when they saw their Lord and teacher being crucified. The Messiah was not supposed to die. He was supposed to reign and usher in a new kingdom. Why did he die? Jesus did nothing wrong, and yet he was crucified along with other criminals. And on Good Friday, the world turned upside down for the disciples. They thought they were going to be those who would sit with this coming king. And as their days of joy and meals and ministry turned into death, I'm sure their hearts sunk because this is not what they were expecting. But three days later, all would make sense. Because three days later, whatever turned upside down turned right side up. As they understood the answer to their question why, the cross was a picture of pain and death for Jesus, but it was also a picture of God's mercy and grace for those who would find forgiveness through what had happened on the cross. I want us to take a closer look at this passages and see some of the important truths of the gospel that will help us to understand sometimes how God's love for us comes at the heel of sometimes difficult days. He sometimes allows his sheep to go through the valleys of the shadow of death to reach the mountaintop of feasts that he has prepared, and so all this so that we can better understand his love. I have three thoughts that come from these texts. The first one is that in order to truly appreciate God's love, we must first uh, embrace his holiness. Secondly, only when God's holiness is appeased are we free to enjoy his love. And thirdly, the rest, the result of this love is praise and proclamation. The first one, the first lesson that we can learn together in these texts is that in order to truly appreciate God's love, we must first embrace his holiness. What this, what this thought encapsulates is that there is a context to the love. In other words, the cross for a lot of people only po- points us toward the salvation that he purchased. But we fail sometimes to understand the gravity of what was purchased for us because we haven't taken the sufficient time to understand why he was on the cross to begin with. And that whatever was a demonstration of love was also a demonstration of God's holiness. Does God love us? How do we know? And oftentimes, even little children will say, because Jesus died for us on the cross. There was a purpose for the cross. The Father didn't just send Jesus to die uh, for no reason. And yet he chose, the, uh, and yet for those closest to Jesus, it made no sense at the time. And those who were with him perhaps were shocked 
because he wasn't supposed, his life wasn't supposed to end. And it looked like their dreams and their hopes literally died that day. God's grace and love are beautiful. And they are beautiful to us as God's holiness is also real and to be feared. The reason why you and I need saving, and I hope that, I know that for many of us who are Christian, this is a reminder of the gospel. And every once in a while, it's a, it's a good thing to take a look back at why we do what we do and what it is that we hold on to as we go through the days. Why do I need to be saved? Well, because of sin. The weightiness of sin is eternally heavy. Consider that one sin that Adam and Eve had committed. It was the eating of a fruit. It wasn't mass murder. It wasn't the most heinous crimes that you've ever heard of in your life. It was eating a fruit. And if anyone hears the story of Genesis in the fall, the first question is, why? How does eating a fruit equate to eternal damnation? Not just for Adam and Eve, but for all of their posterity, of, those, of children and children's children and all of us who now reside on earth. We know that justice means that the punishment, punishment must fit the crime. And one plea from a student at Berkeley said, if the person who ate the fruit would deserve the punishment, even if it is death, at least for the moments, I mean, how long did it take to eat the fruit? Maybe a few minutes. Okay, few minutes of dying. That maybe is worth the punishment. And yet the crime was not against another person. And as we think about the person and the crime, we understand the crime seems so small. It's a fruit. And yet the person offended wasn't another human being. It was God Almighty. And so the person who's, whom this crime was committed against himself was eternal. And some people might say that the justice for the offended eternal being is eternity. Consider all that the blood of bulls and goats in the, in, in the Old Testament are insufficient to pay the price of our sin because they had to be offered over and over again. What was the point of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament? And we find again in the book of Hebrews that the point of the ultimate and final sacrifice was the bloodshed lamb of God. That the blood that was shed ultimately was not the blood of lambs, of bulls and goats, but of the ultimate lamb of God who will come to take away the sin of the world. Consider that it required the sinless blood of God's only son to sufficiently pay the price of our sin. Eternal punishment was required. But Jesus hung on the cross for six hours, arguably from about 9 a.m., to 3 p.m. How did that pay for an eternity that was required? Because the person hanging on the cross wasn't just a man. It was God the Son. Eternity was on that cross. This is the mystery of the gospel. I can't fully explain to you because we know that for sure divinity didn't die because divinity cannot die. Divinity is holy and eternal forever. And yet somehow the mystery of the divine person of Jesus being a man to take sufficiently man's sin and yet eternity coexisting on that cross is the mystery, the profound mystery of Christ on the cross. And consider the history of the cross. The fact that God chose a time in human history where mankind devised the most painful and shameful, heinous way to, uh, to execute another human being. If you study all the different methodologies of how men have created the idea of execution, capital punishment, this can arguably be the worst that mankind has ever devised. Not only was there a walk of shame throughout the city, they had to carry the burden of the very instrument that they would die on. Not only that, but it would be the continued shame that would hang on the cross where they, it would not mean immediate death, 
but sometimes death would be prolonged for days as they hung on a hill for all to see. From a distance, they could see the crosses hanging on the hillside. And every time children would walk by, they'll say, see that? That is for the worst criminals. And that's where our Jesus died. On the night before his death, sleepless, an unjust court, no food, stripped and beaten with inches of his life, a mockery of a crown of thorns and a mockery of a throne, a, a robe supposed to be for a king. He was beaten so much that the instrument that they used would literally strip off uh, strips of flesh from his back. He was given this wood beam to walk this walk of shame, and he was nailed not alone, but next to two criminals. And to top it all off, from noon to three, the scripture tells us that darkness came over the land and God hid his face from his beloved son. I want you to pause with me for a moment and understand. If you hate needles, I think all of us can try to imagine what it would be like to have an inch in diameter nail go through our hands and our feet, and we are mortified. We're thinking, that has got to be the most absolute horrible punishment and painful death I can imagine. But the most painful experience on the cross was not physical, in my, I believe. I believe it was spiritual. Because the physical pain at some point will numb. And what, what was the most painful thing, perhaps, was that as he hung on the cross, the darkness came. And the very one whom he called Abba Father, whom he met every morning and sometimes into the evening from the morning hours, that this person whom he loved so much would turn his face away. In fact, in verse 11 of Psalm 22, the psalmist writes, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Do you know how, how lonely it feels when you're in trouble and there is no 911 to call, no family within reach? The anguish of the soul to realize that you are truly alone is the essence of hell. It is to know that this God, who is almighty and creator, has now distanced himself from me. And I will truly experience the emptiness of being cast from his presence. The love of the father whom he sought after, the one whom he was crying after in prayer the night before, Father, if it is possible, take this cup from me. In his humanity, he didn't, want, he didn't want to go to the cross. But in his obedience, he said, not my will, but your will be done. The father whom he called his beloved Abba Father now stood before him as judge, jury, and executioner. For the father's will was that the son would suffer in this manner. Our sins were upon him, my sin. And the sinless Son of God became sin for us, according to 2 Corinthians 5. This is the holy wrath and judgment of God for our sin. And it fell upon the person of Jesus Christ. James Boyce writes again, Jesus bore our hell that we might share his heaven. To be forsaken means to have the light of God's countenance and the sense of his presence eclipsed, which is what happened to Jesus as he bore the wrath of God against sin for us. And so for me to understand, for us to truly be able to get a glimpse of what God's love means as substitutionary so that it was not I but he, it is to understand the weight of sin and death the true punishment that was supposed to be ours was laid upon Jesus, the sinless one. And so now love begins to sound much more powerful. And there is a beauty to a love that we can embrace 
as we understand the, the reality and the fearfulness of God's holiness. Not only is that true, but secondly, only when God's holiness is appeased are we free to enjoy his love. We can't just come into it. There is a holiness that must be appeased. And so in Matthew 27, the verses that we read, verses 45 to 50, it speaks about this, this punishment, this, this hanging on the cross. When Jesus would say such words as, my God, my God, not Abba Father, but my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Christ experienced the death we deserved. Christ spoke the words that were supposed to be ours. You see, because without Christ, we would all be standing at the judgment throne of God. And the words, after God had displayed and showed the evidence of our sin throughout our life and throughout our history and our parents and so on, that all of us would stand with nothing to say, no advocate on our defense, and all we would be is just facing the reality of our sin, and the judge would say, what do you have for you to say for yourself? We would say nothing, and then we were supposed to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But we will not say those words. If you trust in Jesus Christ, those words he spoke on your behalf. The darkness that had come over this cry that Jesus cried out on the cross. It was not only just a cry, but the work of hanging on the cross and dying for our sins was completed. In verse 50, it says, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. What that meant is yielded up his spirit meant that he finally died. John 19.30 says, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The word, it is finished, is a Greek word that means completed. There's no more to be done. And the reason why the gospel is so beautiful to hear is that every human soul that constantly feels like in religion that I have to do something, that there is, I have to keep adding, I have to keep working, I have to keep performing, and never quite knowing at peace, did I do enough? Am I 51% or am I 49%? This is world religion, but the gospel tells us something differently, that it is completely done. There is no more to be added, nothing more to be done, to be received, to be forgiven and to be loved. Whatever was to be accomplished on the cross was completely accomplished on our behalf. In 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, someone who is our helper with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And this word propitiation is the appeasement. It is, it is the appeasement that God required for our sin. God required something to be done, something to be paid. In fact, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it says, this is love. This is love. The definition of love, that we have, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You see, somehow God's love and definition, it is linked with the payment of sin. That to, for us to understand truly what love is, we must also understand that it was truly paid. The sin was truly paid. That through the cross, God is saying, I am holy. I am demanding a holy propitiation for your sin. But in the end, the cross also says, I love you. Because the one who hung was not us. There's nothing more we can add to the cross. There's nothing more of good ha actions, behaviors, obedience, the acts, things that you can do to make God truly love you fully. And through the cross and the work of Jesus Christ, God has loved you completely 
absolutely and forever. Any act of response of obedience thereafter is a statement of gratitude and love to God. It is not a requirement to add on to the cross. That is, that is not the gospel. In the best, one of the best-selling books that Tim Keller wrote, The Reason for God, he reflects on the substitutionary atonement of Christ and pointing out that in a, world, in a real world of relationships, it is impossible to love people with a problem or a need without in some way sharing or even exchange, changing places with them. All real life changing love involves some form of this kind of exchange. He color goes on to say, imagine you come into contact with a man who's innocent, but who's being hunted down by secret agents or by government or someone other than uh, with, with his, who has power. And he reaches out to you for help and he says, please help me. If you don't help me, I'm going to die. And if you don't help him, he will probably die. But if you help him and ally with him, you are also going to come into mortal danger. This is the stuff that we see in movies and spy movies and so forth. And, he, and we know that he, we, will incre we will experience increased uh, struggles and danger as this person will increase, have increased safety and security through our involvement. Or... He uses the example of parenting. Take children, for example. They come into the world in a condition of complete dependence. They cannot operate in a self-sufficient or independent way unless their parents give up freely their own time for years so that the children can mature and grow up and learn how to live independent on their own. That if the parents don't willingly sacrifice their freedom for the, for the sake of their children, the children will grow up physically, but they will be terribly handicapped and lacking the ability to be able to emotionally or do other acts for themselves. So he says you must be willing to enter into the, de into the dependency they have so eventually they can experience the freedom and independence that you have. And then Keller closes with this thought that all life-changing love toward people with serious needs is a substitutional sacrifice. If you become personally involved with them, in some way their weakness flows toward you and your strength flows toward them. And then he asks, how can a God be a God of love if he does not become personally involved in suffering the same violence, oppression, grief, weakness, and pain that we experience? The answer to that question is twofold. First, he can't. And second, only one major religion even claims that God does. God's love for us is a substitutional demonstration of sacrificial love. For God so loved the world was not a statement, but a demonstration as he sent his only begotten son. God doesn't just say, I love you. He demonstrates I love you. So in order to truly appreciate God's love, we must first embrace his holiness. Secondly, we, we must understand that his holiness demands an appeasement so that we can truly experience and understand his love. And then lastly, the result of seeing and understanding God's love is praise and proclamation. In Psalm 22, verses 22 and 23, it says, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. Every Sunday, countless thousands upon thousands of Christians gather in local churches around the world. And sometimes we enter into these times of worship, joyful, really glad to see others. And there are other times we walk in having a horrible week and you're trying to muster every bit of strength to keep a smile on your face as you see people who don't know what you went through. And as we come into these moments, there are some people who just come neutral, just numb from all the different labor and heartache and, and maybe even just the stress of work or stress of caring for kids or stress for caring for parents and so forth. And I want us to understand that this moment and this space 
is not for us to act or pretend. It's okay. Because uh, there's a large portion of the Psalms that are called laments where we, we come and we, we, it's okay. God says it's okay to come into his presence with mourning, with sorrow, even with possibly words of anger. God, what are you doing? God, why are you so far from me? God, how could you? And it's okay. Because he already knows. The moment you got out of bed, he knows your heart. And there are times when I know people have said, well, Pastor Jim, I woke up and I just, my heart wasn't fully there, so I didn't want to come. And there are other people who may say, you know, um, I just wasn't really blessed. I'm not really getting much out of it. And in our culture, our worship has become a place of receiving. But we did not come to receive worship. We come to give worship. Amen? The worship is, time, is a time and space for us to give something to God. Not The receiving is secondary. And that the audience that we are gathering in the, in the presence of is not the many. It is the one. We are all gathered together to give worship in the presence of Almighty, Almighty God. And it's not about how I feel. I may feel really cruddy waking up. But to come to worship is not because how I feel, it's what he deserves. Because worship is a shortening of worthyship. He is worthy of my praise. So even in heartache, even in questions, even in struggles, he is worthy. And I hope that you understand that it's okay to come to worship as you are. Remember, though, this time is for you to cry out, and to remember that he is worthy, even in some tough days. The second, the second act of response to God's love is proclamation. In verse 27 and following, it says, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nation shall worship before you. Posterity shall serve him, and it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim the righteousness uh, his righteousness to a people yet unborn, yet he has, that he has done it. It speaks here of a generation that was unborn and a posterity who will serve him. What we see here is that church, one of the main reasons why we are still here is so that we can proclaim the gospel to people who have not yet heard. Some of them, our own children. One of the things that I, I, find, uh, I found so interesting is that if salvation was the completed end of work of God, then the moment you and I say, I believe in Jesus Christ, we should have just ascended to heaven, right? I believe in Jesus Christ, and we should have just gone, right? But we're here. Why? Why did Jesus ascend by himself and leave his disciples? Because he told them to go and make disciples of all nations. He left them a task to do on his behalf. And he said, you're going to do greater works than even I did. By the power of the Holy Spirit, together. That's what a church is. Empowered by the Holy Spirit to be his witnesses, to tell of his graces and mercies and of his love. The first picture of this is Sunday school. Every church has some type of children's program. Why? Because we are to tell the next generation. This is one of the most important groups of people that need to hear about Jesus Christ. And if you ever wonder, why do, why do we need a Sunday school? Why do I need to serve there? It's one of the ways that we as covenant people share with our covenant children. That they may not be your children, but they're our children. And we love them and we tell them the message that we have heard. This needs to continue generation upon generation. Worship at home, between families and couples. 
This also is very important. And then worshiping together. The children need to see us worshiping. There's a picture that I have in my head of my daughter. She's 16 now, but there was a time when she was probably four or five. And I was praising God with my hands up. And I look over and I see her doing this. I don't think she knew what she was doing. She was copying me. And I can tell you as a father, I almost was taken to tears. Not only are we to do this with the immediate community of our family, but we are to do this for those to the end of the earth who will remember and the families of nations so that ultimately they will worship you. John Piper writes that missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship for the false God exists, but worship of the true and living God needs to be found and present. I also want to share with you that Sharing the gospel is not about the duty of trying to sell Jesus to someone who doesn't want to hear it or to try to give every answer to every question to every person who asks a question. I can't do that. I don't know too many pastors who could do that, much less church members. I love the fact that Acts 1 tells us to go be his witnesses, not go be the apologists or salesmen of religion. Witnesses are simply people who, love, who are in love. Have you ever been around someone who just fell in love? They are annoying to be around. Because they just can't stop talking about this person they fell in love with. Oh my gosh, she is... Okay, I'm sorry, maybe guys don't talk that way. <laughs> Dude, he's, she's so whatever. And, and the ladies would say, oh my gosh, he's so good. He's so cute, whatever, whatever. He loves the Lord. People in love, you can't shut them up. Because they love someone so much. They can't help but share it with others. That's what it is. I've seen people, I've seen guys tell another guy or a lady tell another lady about something so good. Did you ever hear that? When they talk about a restaurant that's such good food and, dude, it's only like 15 bucks or 10 bucks. you got to go. I'll take you. I'll buy you. And that, that's evangelism. Because that person's like, okay, okay, I'll go. And so this becomes a question to us. We know God loves us, and now the question is, do we love him? Are we truly convinced that of all the people that we could ever have a relationship with, this Jesus, boy, he is amazing. And every chance I get to tell you about him, I would love to do so. I'm not saying this to guilt trip you. I just want you to ask are you trying to muster something good to say? Or can people just not shut you up because you're so in love? Often many of us are somewhere in the middle. Some of us are in a marriage where we're like, yeah, I love him. <laughs> He's good. I entitled this message, P.S. I Love You. First, because it's from a psalm. And second, because... P.S. used to stand for postscript. It was, it was used during the times when editing was not done on a computer and a push of a button. But after you had written something, because you don't want to rewrite the entire letter, you would write P.S. and then write something that you wanted to add or clarify in your letter. For us today in this psalm, it is not a postscript. It's a praise script. It starts with something dark. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It prophesies about the fact that they have pierced my hands and my feet. They cast lots for my clothing. Dogs have circled around me. And all this to simply remind us that one future day, someone else would say these words and not us. I want to leave you with a story of a Southern Baptist preacher by the name of Tony Campolo. He got a chance to preach at his church on Good Friday. And there were five other preachers who were preaching that Sunday. This is a black church. This is a, this is a, this is a Caucasian uh, sociology professor who loved attending a black church. And so this Sunday worship, they have five preachers. You're lucky you only have one. <laughs> 
And so Tony goes up, and he preaches his heart out on Good Friday. And after he's done, he sits down, and he taps the knee of his senior pastor. And, he's, and uh, you know, his, his senior pastor taps him, and he says, you know what? You did all right, son. You did all right. And Tony turned to him and said, you're next. You're going to be able to top that? And the pastor said, son, sit back. Because this old man is going to do you in. Tony said he did him in with one line. He said, it's a Friday, but Sundays are coming. (laughs) He said, it's Friday. Friday, Jesus was dead on the cross. But that's because it was Friday. Sundays are coming. And someone, someone yelled, Keep on. Keep on going, preacher. He said, it's only Friday, but Sundays are coming. But here's the good news. It may feel like a Friday, but Sundays are coming. He went on for an hour with this line. And he said the congregation by this point was in a ruckus. It was an electric atmosphere. Not just because the preacher was preaching but because it's Friday and Sundays are coming. My dear brothers, my sisters, sometimes it feels like a Friday. But may I proclaim to you, Sundays are coming. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, this Sunday, like any Sunday, we gather here to give you worship, something you deserve no matter how our week was, no matter how we felt waking up, and no matter what happened on the way to church. You are worthy of our praise. And yet sometimes we come also with questions that plague our heart and leave us restless. I pray today, somehow, your Holy Spirit would remind each dear person that no matter how hard the questions and days may be, that your grace and mercy is sufficient for today. That what was done on Calvary's cross was not only sufficient for that day, but for every day for the rest of eternity. Thank you, Jesus for fixing what we couldn't have done on our own, what would have taken an eternity for us to pay back. And if there's ever a reason for us to give you praise or to tell another with a big smile on our face, let me tell you about Jesus. I pray that it would be because we have come to understand that this love that the scripture speaks about came at a high price, a price you paid, a price you didn't have to pay, but a price you paid completely, forever, for eternity. And for that, we give you praise. May the rest of this day be honoring to you in both rest and worship. And may this beloved church called Exchange Church be a gathering of your people, men, women, and children who love you and have been called to praise you and to proclaim your goodness all the days of our life. And I lift this church up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take this time to uh, reflect on the message and uh, give our offering. If you're new or visiting today, please do not feel obligated to give. Uh, If you have prepared something, let's give in response to God's abundant grace for us.
Close this time of corporate worship with a benediction. And now, may the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and empowerment of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.